Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Aus. I'm one of the family doctor here in Dawson Creek. I've been practicing here for about two to four years here. All right, so let's get started. Struggle of statins in older adults. We have nothing to disclose. We are using patient video in the presentation, but we have received verbal and written permission. So our learning objectives today, we are going to discuss the risks and benefits of cholesterol-lowering agents, primary versus secondary, review evidence of cholesterol-lowering agents in older adults along with the evidence for lipid targets, as well as considerations when de-prescribing these agents, and as well decision aid tools and communication strategies to help patients make these informed decisions. So as we know, statins are some of the most widely prescribed medications in the world. However, frequent use of these agents has led to continual scrutiny of their safety and ongoing debate about their role in therapy, particularly rating, relating to the older adult population. So we just wanna start off with a first case study here. Mrs. Ebb is a 69 year old female. She has hypertension, diabetes, as well as hypothyroidism. She has no history of cardiovascular disease, stroke, or chronic kidney disease. Her blood pressure is not currently controlled doesn't know her family history, non-smoker, however, she's not active. She is obese and does report cramps with statin in the past. Her labs are as follows. Her total cholesterol is 8.78 with an LDL of 6.02. Now, what, how many of you would be comfortable initiating a statin? Why or why not? We'll leave that for now. <laughs> we'll talk about her a little bit later. So just a quick uh, review of the pathophysiology. Uh, it involves inflammation of plaque that leads to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. There's primary and secondary causes, of course. Uh, the most important secondary cause of dyslipidemia in developed countries is a sedentary lifestyle with excessive dietary intake of total cal calories, saturated fat, cholesterol, and trans fats as well as cigarette smoking, diabetes, alcohol overuse, hypothyroidism, etc. Now, the one thing I like to point out here is the proof of benefit is strongest with decreasing LDL levels for now. There's been multiple randomized controlled trials that have shown that APOB predicts risks similarly or even better than LDL. However, the CCS guidelines recognize that clinicians are more familiar with LDL, so it's being continued to recommend at this point, but there is anticipation of a shift in the future. Now, does high cholesterol always equal increased risk in older adults? The association between mortality and increased cholesterol is uncertain. Cholesterol levels appear to be unrelated to mortality within ages of 70 and 90 years old. And the protective effects in the very old appear to be independent of total cholesterol. So some of the important studies, the 4S, CARDS, and HPS trials have demonstrated that for high-risk individuals on a statin, irrespective of their LDL achieved demonstrated a decrease in cardiovascular events. Just to compare some guidelines that you may be uh, used to, we have, um, some have specific targets like the American Heart Association guidelines that recommend primary prevention um, to be considered for adult patients based on LDL levels and specific high-risk patient characteristics like diabetes. Whereas the Alberta guidelines, the Towards Optimized Practice guidelines, show that there is not as much specific levels and the repeat levels of cholesterol is actually only repeated every five years. But meeting these targets comes at what cost to the patient. So monitoring these levels, there's variation to, which can show a total cholesterol of almost about 15%. An average increase of cholesterol per patient is only about 0.5 to 1% a year. So we have to keep this in mind when assessing the lab values. The signal of a small increase in cholesterol levels is difficult to detect against the background of short-term variability, like biologic and analytic variation. In annual rechecks in adherent patients, many apparent increases in cholesterol levels may actually be false positives. So I'll explain in the next slide here. You can use this tool to analyze the different variables that can affect these levels. So 
analytic variation, there's always a degree of uncertainty around the result of any clinical lab test that can vary from lab to lab. Biologic vari variation is when repeated measurements are made over time on a specific individual where normal physiologic processes that results in biological variation, which examples are listed down along the side here. And reference interval is different ranges that apply for patients at different stages of their life or with different characteristics. So with all of these variations, specifically to LDL, there's actually a 14.1% difference in lab values. So if you plug in a LDL of five, it could actually be anywhere from 3.83 to 6.17. So we need to keep in mind when assessing these trends in patients' labs. The first line treatment, lifestyle considerations remain the cornerstone of chronic disease prevention. And patients like to think they can compensate for poor dietary choices and sedentary lifestyle when they're taking something like a statin. And of course, statins inhibit the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme in cholesterol synthesis, which is here, which leads to the upregulation of LDL receptors and increased LDL clearance. They reduce LDL cholesterol by up to nearly 60% and produce small increases in HDL and modest decreases in triglycerides. Oops, back up. Some alternative lipid therapies, there's fibrates, azidamib, and niacin. Um, however, unfortunately, the evidence is mixed or lacking um, specifically in combination of fibrates and, and statins. There's no more evidence that they're any more effective than monotherapy. But of course, fibrates are used with increased triglycerides for pancreatitis prevention. Azidamib is another one that is another reasonable medication to de-prescribe if looking to decrease pill burden because there's just very limited evidence for their efficacy. Now, the PCSK9 inhibitors is interesting. They're relatively new. However, their numbers needed to treat is still quite high at 65 compared to placebo over two and a half years. And unfortunately, it's just not cost-effective at this point at costing patients $650 a month. That's, that's just, that's crazy. <laughs> um, but I've heard actually that these medications will be in the 2021 guidelines coming up in the spring. So it'll be interesting to see what they say. Now, I don't wanna forget about natural supplements. Cholesterol is included as one of the top 10 conditions for which patients are using complementary and alternative medicine. And 2017 found that the prevalence of concurrent prescription drugs and CAM used in older adults varied quite widely, anywhere from 5.3 to 88.3%. And we know this is important when we're looking at identifying and managing risks for potential adverse reactions in our populations. I wanna specifically talk about the red yeast rice as it includes monocolin monoc K, which is chemically identical to the active ingredients in lovastatin. These side effects that apply to statins as well as red yeast rice because they have the same active ingredient. There's also some concern um, with these unregulated supplements that contain citronin, which is a toxic byproduct of the fermentation process, which is known to cause kidney failure. And in a 2017 analysis of 28 red yeast rice supplements, they showed that almost all of them contain monoclonal K in highly variable quantities that were generally above the legal limit. So our approach to statins, our first question we need to ask, why is this patient on the medication in the first place? How is their medication adherence? Is this for primary or secondary prevention? And what are their risk factors? And of course, at higher cardiovascular risk, they stand to benefit more. But we also know that clinically, not all older adults are made the same. So you can see here, the lady on the left looks quite different than the lady on the right. And if anyone can guess, she's actually, the lady on the left is 81 years old. Her name's Ernestine Shepard, and she holds the Guinness World Record for being the oldest female bodybuilder at 81. So of course, we can't compare both. You know, the lady on the right, whether frailty comes into consideration, quality of life, comorbidities, dementia, etc. 
So would you consider starting a statin for primary prevention on both of these patients? So for primary prevention, clinical judgment and shared decision-making is important when considering statin therapy. And these risk assessment tools can help the clinician and patient make informed decision-making on whether a statin should be started. Now, however, there is no validated risk assessment tools for benefit with statin therapy for individuals over the ages of 75 to 79, depending on which tool you use. And these risk calculators are not without limitations. For example, in paired comparisons, risk calculators can disagree about risk levels, so from high to moderate or moderate to low, approximately 33% of the time. Secondary prevention is a little bit more straightforward. It's recommended for everybody regardless of age. Now you can consider going from a high intensity to a moderate intensity for those over 75, as there's a lack of evidence for benefit to pin comparing the two. And sometimes there is more of an increased risk with the high level intensity statin, and there's more discontinue rates because of those adverse events. Now we wanna consider as well that patients who are on these statins beyond the age of 75, if they're tolerating them fine, there is no need to reduce the potency just due to age alone. But why are older adults at an increased risk for these adverse events? We need to think about the effect of aging on normal body physiology. So this diagram shows the percentage of organ function at 75 to 80 years of age compared to 100% function at, for a 20 year old. So the risk of statins as we know, myalgia is one of the most common. Statin myopathy is likely to have greater impact in older adults due to their limited musculoskeletal reserve, due to decreased muscle mass, muscle strength, and mobility. Liver enzyme increases may normalize if the statin dose is reduced. And it's important to note that these elevations don't always recur if an individual resumes the statin after it was discontinued. So risk assessment is important. If the patient is at high risk for cardiovascular events, this repeated trial could be significant. And studies have reported reversible cognitive impairment, not so much dementia. So we just need to monitor these patients for cognitive event, effects. If they occur, we can stop the statin and see if the, the symptoms resolve. If they do, they should resolve within a few weeks. And we can also attempt to restart at a lower dose if necessary. Now, there are also increase of AKI, which seems to be more risk associated with the high potency statin use. And the highest risk is in usually in the first four months of use. And for diabetes, it's more, again, more common in older adults. And we have to kind of look at the risk versus benefit again. And is the incidence of diabetes due to lifestyle comorbidities for other reasons, or is it directly related to the statin? Sometimes this is difficult to, to know right off the hop. And one thing to note, as, as most of us know, we need to remind ourselves that we need baseline lab work so that we can monitor for any fluctuations, specifically CK. And so now, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Some questions to ask, should statins be used definitely? Is lower always better? Can these statins lead to prescribing cascades? When is it safe to de-prescribe? And who feels comfortable to do so? Here's a list, a long list of some of the interactions that the drugs can have, but we need to keep in mind the mechanism of action of these drugs as not all statins are made the same. So here, certain classes of drugs are metabolized by the intestines by the enzyme called CYP3A, which normally reduces the amount of drug that enters the bloodstream. So in particular, grapefruit juice contains compounds called furanocoumarins that stop this enzyme from doing its job. As a result, more of the drug is absorbed, making it more powerful than it's meant to be. So for simvastatin, one glass of grapefruit juice can actually increase the concentration by 260%. So if that's an issue, if someone really wants their grapefruit juice, we, you could use rosuvastatin or pravastatin because they use a different metabolic pathway. And a couple other furanocumarins that are found are also in fruits like pomegranates and vegetables of parsnips and celery. However, they're not as concentrated as some like 
like they are in grapefruit. And as well, dosing and schedule matters. So you can see for simvastatin, it was shown to have significant difference in efficacy when taken in the evening as opposed to in the morning. These drugs are more important in the evening, whereas these ones, the other ones can be done at any time. And we also need to take in consideration renal function as you can consider using going from rosuvastatin to atorvastatin as it can be used no matter the renal function, whereas rosuvastatin, for example, has to be dose reduced as plasma concentrations can increase about three times in patients with severe renal impairment for or creatinine clearance less than 30. Now, I really like this slide. This was uh, done by a presentation by Therapeutics Initiative by James McCormick and Dr. Jessica Audie. And this shows a great representation of the dose increases do not lead to the same proportional uh, re percentage reduction in LDL cholesterol. So you can see with a torvastatin, 10 milligrams should reduce LDL cholesterol by about 35%. Now, if you give some, a patient eight times the dose at 80 milligrams, you're only going to see about a 55% reduction, which is only a 15% change, and yet you're giving the patient eight times the dose. So here's another way to see if 80 milligrams has 100% effect, then 10 milligrams has 75% of the LDL lowering effects, but at only an eighth of the dose. Now comparing numbers needed to treat in primary versus secondary prevention. It's primary prevention in older adults at high risk of cardiovascular disease without established disease. You can see statins significantly reduce the incidence of MI and stroke, but do not significantly prolong survival in the short term. So these were done from 3.5 year follow-up and a five year follow-up versus secondary prevention where you can see numbers needed to treat are significantly lower. So as one moves toward frailty, quality of life and patient preference often takes precedent. I think it's important that we treat the patient, not the number. I'd like to quickly touch on, it was just published here in June of 2020 on the efficacy of statin treatment on cardiovascular outcomes in elderly patients, which pretty much summarizes what we've kind of been talking about so far, that there's a lot more evidence for secondary prevention versus primary prevention. Um, and they address that the complexity of older adults really um, with like the comorbidities and adverse effects research results were difficult in, to interpret and that's why a lot of times older adults aren't used and excluded from pre-marketing clinical trials and that's some of the reasoning why there isn't as many studies on older adults. And what I really liked was the comparison they did on, this is just one of the pages anyways of the studies they compared, but it showed the number of elderly patients that were in each trial, the comparisons on what they were actually analyzing, the outcomes, the follow-up years, age ranges. And one thing I'd like to highlight for sure is the, the percentage of male sex. So you can see that a lot of these trials, 70%, 76%, 80%, like a lot of them have a males of 80% in the trial. So how can you compare these to your female patients? So a lot of times we don't look as in depth into these studies and this is you know, one thing to kind of keep in the back of your head. Now, one important the shared decision making, the best interest of the patient is the only interest really to be considered. Um, and it's that partnership based on empathy, exchanging information about the available options, deliberating while considering the potential consequences of each one and making a decision by consensus. This is a great uh, toolkit that was developed by the Mayo Clinic that you can use to help with and when we can have patients in the office, we can use these tools to help them make that decision. So looking back, I'm gonna go to case one again, Mrs. Ebb. And this is one of the, the tools that you can use. And I plugged in all of her information here on the left-hand side and you, this uses the Framingham risk score. So this would let her see if she was to do absolutely nothing at this point, that she would have a 55% risk in 10 years of having some type of cardiovascular event. So what can we do to reduce those risks? 
this. I know I'm sorry, it's a little bit busy, but here this can also play in part, not just statins, but physical activity as well as diet changes. So for here, if she was just to increase her activity, she would reduce her risk by 25%. And as well, as well, the Mediterranean diet or low fat diet, she would reduce her risk by 30%. Now comparing statins, a low dose to moderate intensity statin, she as well would reduce her risk by 25%. So you could ask her, you know, are you willing to change your physical, to physical activity every day? Or would you like to take a pill, which also brings in part and parcel harms of the risks that come with taking a pill every day. And I really like the way to explain it as comparing it to car insurance. You know, there are a variety of options that you can choose and you hope you never have to use it. However, there's still a chance that you might get in a car accident. So how much risk are you willing to take? And here the, with a high intensity, there's a benefit of 35%. But the one thing that's very interesting is looking at blood pressure control. So for Mrs. Ebb, her blood pressure wasn't completely under control. And so if we could just get that under control before anything else, she would have a risk reduction of 50%. So it's, it's quite interesting to use these comparisons to let help patients decide. This is just another quick a uh, tool that you can use, another version where they can compare them side by side and gives you the si benefits, risks right there in one, one slide. And this is another one, My Health Checkup, which allows you to compare. There's a little bit more that they take into consideration. So they actually ask the patients what their medication adherence is, uh, any peripheral vascular disease, what their compliance is with their diabetes control, and also more specific on what types of exercise they do from moderate versus uh, vigorous exercise. So for Mrs. Ebb, she's currently 69, but actually her, her heart age is 75.7. And this also gives another, another way for you to be able to look all in one slide of all the different risks and what she can do. And they also give her all the different strategies that she can use as well and what would help lower her risks. Now I'm going to leave it for us to, to do the summary. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Raina, for organizing the, this presentation. Thank you, Christy, for first part of the presentation. And I'd like also to thank Dr. Helm, Dr. Perry, and uh, Dr. Venter for joining us today. Uh, I noticed also Dr. Okafor also here. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Remy. Thank you to the people in uh, Timber Ridge for joining us uh, and helping us in presentation. And also I want to share the thanks to Dr. Fletcher who spent some time yesterday uh, giving us some notes and feedback on our presentation. So I'm Dr. Ausser Shihabi. I'm one of the physicians here in Dawson Creek, one of the family doctors uh, here. Disclosure, I have nothing to declare. Uh, okay. So as part of our polypharmacy project, we considered statin as one of the challenging medication to consider, stopping or tapering off, especially in elderly population. To help healthcare provider address statin polypharmacy, me and Christy and polypharmacy team are considering developing why, when, and how, and what framework. In this presentation, I will use some friendly terms instead of pure medical terms. And uh, trust me, I will use some refreshment at the end of my uh, presentation. It will not take long. So keeping medical terms in between brackets. So I will start with statin facts, followed by a uh, uh, simple talk about uh, a Lancet article about uh, the use of uh, statin in elderly. Uh, and actually it's about a meta-analysis meta of 28 uh, trials. And then I will share a snapshot of my patients uh, that I'm taking care of in rotary manner. Um, I have about 40 patients and I'll share their statin use. And at the end of the presentation, I will share a framework that I'm, I mean, I want to share with others. And it looks like this, and there's a reason. Uh, 
looks not very well aligned because it is adjustable, modifiable, and open to suggestion and addition from you, from you guys. So I'll just go quickly over statin facts. Statins are also called uh, MG-CoA reductase inhibitor, and they are used to lower blood cholesterol. And they've been used for primary prevention and secondary prevention. As Christy said, I mean, we went over the, the reason why we are using statins. How do they work? They work in three mechanisms, in three ways. First, by inhibiting cholesterol synthesis. They also by increasing LDL uptake. And also they work by a, inhibiting a mechanism called uh, protein prenylation. Protein prenylation is just like addition of hydrophobic molecules to a protein. So decreasing protein prenylation is important in an improvement of endothelial function and modulation of immune system. Um, it's quite interesting that this uh, inhibition of uh, protein prenylation uh, is important for statin to work, but also found to be uh, one of the main causes of uh, its side effect, including muscle pain, myopathy, and increased blood sugar. Statin. Uh, I'll go over some statin uh, bloopers, I call it, side effects. The source is up to date. And by the way, if anybody needs uh, some of the uh, sources, I can send it as an email at the end of the presentation. So as uh, in previous presentation, one of the most important uh, side effect is muscle pain, muscle myopathy, I mean myopathy. That can range from muscle pain, rhabdomyolysis, and even statin associated autoimmune myopathy. Um, those uh, side effects increases with age and the use of other medication like fibrase, and also in a condition uh, called hypothyroidism. Uh, so we have to be mindful when we are uh, using uh, such medication, the statin in, in hypothyroid patients and elderly people. Um, as mentioned, the diabetes, is, there is an increased risk of developing uh, diabetes, which is more in people who are using intensive statin therapy, which is usually we are using it in people who post uh, myocardial infarction just to keep this in mind. And also there's an uh, impact on liver and which is mainly in the first three months of the therapy. And it is actually dose dependent. Interestingly, there's also an effect on androgen synthesis. Uh, they found that uh, it might, the use of statin might lower androgen levels in men. Luckily it is uh, uh, of no, of, not of clinical significance. Um, lupus, there's some reported uh, drug-induced lupus in patients receiving statins. To continue the side effects, renal impact, there is some proteinuria, and usually it is, seems to be it is a benign finding, but we, we have to keep our eye on it. Um, regarding behavioral and cognitive, uh, um, I hope Dr. Okafor will be able to share his uh, experience with the uh, statin news and mental health. But according to the uh, up-to-date, uh, statin does not appear uh, to, to affect uh, or to increase uh, the suicide or depression. And there's no significant uh, uh, data about cancer, cataract, and neuropathy. Most interestingly that I found uh, on, on up to date, I thought to share it with you, is the effect of statin on immune response. So they, there were some observational studies uh, that uh, showed that immune response to influenza immunization might be lowered. So especially in elderly people. Um, I'm not sure now we are in the COVID time and what about the COVID vaccine? I haven't had the chance to look into this, but uh, I'm happy to hear uh, any discussion or uh, any information about the statin and COVID vaccine, if there's something available. And uh, now, sorry, that went up to directly to the refreshment, sorry. Okay, so statin relationship with other medicines, interaction. Um, I thought to share a few medication 
they are of significance. Uh, um, but we have to keep in mind that statins differ. So we have to find out what type of the statin the patient is using and what other medication that patient that they're using. Most common uh, medication that we are using that can cause myopathy and rhabdomyolysis in conjunction uh, with the use of statin are calcium channel blockers, amidaron, and fibrate, and also colchicine. Especially colchicine, we don't want to cause more pain for the patient. And I usually see patients who are having muscle aches and, uh, and they are gout. And I believe sometimes I've been treating them as as uh, as just gout attacks. So just we have to be mindful if the patient is using statin. Now, the refreshment, grapefruit juice. Um, I'm not sure how many people like grapefruit juice, but there is an interesting um, uh, relationship or, you know, between statin and grapefruit. Um, it is found that the use of grapefruit juice might increase the uh, risk of myopathy, and especially with simvastatin. And uh, this risk is not much with other um, uh, statins, with other statins. Um, so if the patient likes to use, uh, to, use to, to have grapefruit, so this is the grapefruit and those are their friends. Rosso, Pita, Flu, Vestatin, they are more friendly with the grapefruit. So they will have less likely side effect when the patient is using statin and having grapefruit. Now we are in the almost uh, finishing our presentation. And uh, I thought to share a Lancet uh, article, which is uh, uh, about efficacy and safety of statin therapy in older people. Actually, it is a meta-analysis of uh, data taken from 28 randomized controlled trials. And here are the findings. So it has been found that statin is, decreases uh, major vascular events, decreased major coronary events, and also very important in the reduction in coronary revascularization procedures, decreased ischemic strokes and decreased mortality. Keeping that in mind, it's, so it is found that this trend, the trend of decrease is changing over, uh, over time. So the benefit from statin changes. So, so regarding the major vascular events, we can see uh, there is a decrease in benefit of statin with increasing age in primary prevention. And for secondary prevention, this benefit has not changed according to the meta-analysis. Major coronary events decrease with increasing age. Coronary vascularization stays the same. Now ischemic stroke, there is the trend of, of benefit of statin has stayed the same. However, it has found that it has been found that uh, it might increase the hemorrhagic strokes. And finally, the decreased mortality, the benefit of using statins decreases with age. And if you like more inform, I mean more detailed data, I will be happy to share it uh, with you at the end of the presentation. I can share the meta-analysis. Now, uh, being one of the uh, family doctors here in Dawson Creek, I am privileged to take care of some patients in, uh, in Rotary Manor, and I have about 40 patients. And uh, I went and looked into their statin use, and I found that out of 40 patients, six are are actually using statin and 34 are not using. So 85 of the elderly patients that I'm taking care of are not using statins. I'm not sure if I'm lucky or I have something to do to, to look into those uh, uh, 34 patients, but definitely I will go over 
the uh, six patients to see if there's any side effect and screen them. Finally, this is the framework that I uh, uh, like to share uh, and, and how to deal with the statin in elderly. So like first question, is the patient on statin? Is it for primary or secondary prevention? What is the statin? What is the dosage that the patient is on? What are the current medication? And then we need to screen for side effect, screen for lifestyle, diet, if they are a grapefruit lover. We have to consider, you know, changing medication, reducing dose, reducing, yeah. And we need to know more information about uh, the patient, cognitive status, and also family. Um, please feel free to add and remove blocks from the blocks that I put. And uh, it's about developing a framework to to address uh, statin polypharmacy and how how to be more familiar. And, and, and how to deal with the statin usage. Uh, because it seems to be, the statin use seems to be more static rather than dynamic. We take it for granted that this, the patient on statin, the patient will seems to be staying on statin. So probably developing this framework will just prompt me at least to investigate more and to read more about the statin use. And I hope that you like the refreshments. Uh, sorry, we are in Zoom meeting. I cannot share much of drinks. I have coffee in my hand. And thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, thank you in karate. And uh, I don't, I have difficulty uh, reading it, but I think Rachel can help us pronouncing the, uh, the thank you in karate because she's yeah. interested in I mean, thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.